Uh, Scott Trout, many of you know. Uh, Scott Trout is, he's an uh, executive partner at Cordell & Cordell. He's also CEO of Cordell & Cordell. Um, he's been teaching litigation for, you probably don't want to admit, a couple decades. Uh, Scott and I started out together uh, with Cordell & Cordell uh, some 20 plus years ago. Uh, and so we, uh, Scott has been focused on a lot of the complex litigation in recent years. Uh, Scott has been prominent in some cases that have changed law in the state of Missouri. Many of you are familiar with those, so I won't go over that. But, um, but Scott regularly teaches litigation not only in Missouri, but in other states as well. Uh, so it's an it's a opportunity for him to speak this year. I know in the past some years he's had other things going on. He wasn't able to come and speak. So this year he's teaming up with another uh, excellent attorney we have. You know, I mentioned some that, that will be speaking today that are not from Missouri. One of those is Courtney Knox. She's a practice manager for Cordell & Cordell. She uh, manages 25 or so attorneys um, in five different states. Uh, she's very good at what she does. Scott, of course, is regularly a super lawyer. That's a, that's a designation voted on by your peers, by peer practitioners in family law, for example, in this case. And um, for those who have less than 10 years experience, and Courtney is at 10 years this year, you're a rising star. And so she's been a, a voted rising star, which is a super lawyer counterpart for, the ten, for that category of experience. Uh, many times, at least four times. So, uh, so they, they, this year she hits the 10-year mark. Uh, but they're both uh, excellent litigators. They do a lot of litigation, and the topic is to update you on new law this year. And Scott will lead that discussion. Uh, join me in welcoming Scott Trout and Courtney Knox. Oh, well, good morning. So we're going to some of these cases that uh, that uh, we picked out. Uh, we're really the intent was to get cases in notable areas, not necessarily these earth-shattering decisions, because there are so many out there that I think uh, we could spend two hours. So we just literally went through and picked out cases that just were notable, had something interesting about them. So I, I can't tell you that they're earth-shattering. It's more of uh, just updates on, on the law. So uh, who uh, reads the weekly slip opinions that come out on Tuesday? Anyone? I mean, it's something I was a nerd and have done that literally since I got out of practice, or out of law school, is because it's not every week that you get a family law case, but you can learn something from all of the cases. Whether it be civil procedure, there's always something notable, and I would encourage you to just log on and just check out the slip opinions on Tuesdays. And you can see, and you'll see from our presentation, we didn't discriminate and pull all Eastern District, we pulled Southern and Western, because you can see there are very, are varying wildly opinions in terms of the topics. And you all know, and I think if you've been practicing enough, you can kind of predict what the Western and the Southern will do compared to the Eastern uh, on certain topics or what the opinion will look like. And so that's what we've done. But I would encourage you to read the slip opinions because they're so valuable uh, and you can just learn so much. And that's kind of where I'll, I'll be sitting in you know, a settlement conference and I will have just reviewed a case and I'll say it or mention it and everybody looks at me like I'm insane, but I've always taught some of the younger lawyers to do slip opinions and read the Supreme Court rules because those are just something that you can always benefit from. So uh, let's get started. And, and I know I can promise you that one of the things I was preparing again last night, I am certain I'm going to obliterate the facts and the holding with someone who probably handled this ca the cases in here. I was trying to think, OK, I'm going to go through and see who the attorneys were so I know. And I'm going to spot you. And, and so if, you, if I obliterate it and I do it wrong, just go ahead and point it out. But um, many of you, and certainly on the Eastern District, there are some that, that are in here that I'm sure the attorneys are in here. But I'll do my best to kind of go through. It's a little boring to start off with a case law update because we're just talking about cases and not necessarily giving you tips like I've done in the past and, and kind of suggestions on practice, but uh, it'll serve its purpose. So <clears throat> let's start with Otis versus Otis. It was a Southern District case, 33453. Uh, it was issued in July of 2015. And it dealt with the issue, uh, which I felt was interesting, was maintenance. And so some of the facts that are appropriate that we can talk about. Uh, wife of 66 retired and receiving uh, pension or retirement benefits of $707 a month. Uh, she testified at trial that she was unable to work due to health issues. Husband, 57, employed gainfully. And the uh, interesting issue here was that the court 
awarded non-modifiable maintenance, uh, basically till death or remarriage, so a lifetime award. The court uh, interestingly found, the trial court, that wife was incapable of any employment for the rest of her life uh, at all, or re-education. Kind of jumped to that conclusion. <clears throat> so, uh, I think if you were to read the facts, and as exactly as I described them to you, you would easily reach the conclusion quickly that the Court of Appeals did, which was they reversed it. There's an inter interesting comment in the opinion, that's the reason why we picked it, but what the court found was that there was no evidence that wife was incapable of obtaining employment ever. I mean, I gotta imagine, absent some serious, serious health issues, which there was no evidence of that at the trial level, that any judge would find that you know she's capable of something. But what was very interesting and of note here, because I, you know, when we I counsel clients, we talk about maintenance in Missouri, and that is one, there's no formula. Two, it's lifetime, and unless you're going to settle it and try to get some sort of close-in deal. But what the court went very interestingly to great lengths to talk about in what instances a non-modifiable award would exist. And so they, they went on and talked about it. And they said, just as important, it was in the case of uh, In Ray, the Marriage of Michael. And they said that there was no evidence that husband's income expenses would ever change, but ultimately, they went on to discuss what perhaps a non-modifiable award would look like. They said it's justified when you have testimony with regards to health. You can have a doctor come in and testify about the inability of employment in the future. So they went at great lengths to kind of set the standard of what you're going to need in order to get that non-modifiable award, even how small uh, of a percentage of those cases in which it exists. So they basically saw, talked about Michael about what didn't exist, so the inverse being what do you need to prove, and that is medical records or an expert testimony regarding health situation to prove inability for any employment. So basically, the court reversed on those facts and just made it modifiable. They didn't reverse it in any other manner uh, in terms of amount, but that's why I felt Otis was of interest. <clears throat> All right, moving on in the same area, Hershend, which is a more of a complex case. Uh, Hershend v. Hershend, it's a Southern District. There were two appeals that were consolidated in September of 2015, uh, cross appeals, so they consolidate them, which is not un un unusual. But again, another maintenance among uh, a number or myriad of other issues, including property and attorney's fees, which are, is of value. Now, keep in mind, what I'm going to point out today isn't the only issue that's of value. I think all these cases have a number of issues in family law that are relevant and are worthy of reading. Uh, it's ser if you just take the uh, slip opinion number and type it in Google, it will pop up right away, number one. So I didn't give you the Southwest, the Southwest citations. So some of the facts in Hershen. Married in 2000, separated in 2011. Husband owned varying degrees of businesses and other interests. Wife had employment history, no college or just a few college courses and a GED. The troubling aspect, I think, of this case, and of all, I think, of all the cases we're gonna talk about briefly today, this is the one that bothers me the most. Um, albeit Southern District, no offense, but this is the kind of opinion I would expect out of the Southern District. Wife was awarded $6,560 a month in maintenance. It wasn't an issue of his ability to pay. It, was, it really landed on her expenses. The court concluded here, and keep in mind 6560, but the court concluded that her reasonable needs and expenses to maintain her previous standard of living were $5,670.61. So the court awarded $889.39 more than her reasonable needs and expenses to maintain the previous standard of living. That was about 14% more than what she needed, period. So their quote, the, quote, uh, the court quotes in Ray the marriage of Ross. Uh, which is 231 Southwest 3rd, 877, to justify its reasoning. It says, an award of maintenance may include a reasonable amount above the itemized expenses of the party seeking maintenance to meet, quote, unexpected day-to-day -day expenses, which given their nature may be reasonable, yet are incapable of specific itemization. And that's on page eight, 886 
of in re the marriage of Ross. What this holding does to complicate our job to counsel clients on what maintenance is going to be, because there's no formula. We all know in St. Louis County you can kind of somewhat predict. Now, if you were to follow this case, there's no way, because they're saying, well, we'll set the reasonable needs and expenses, but perhaps we're going to go higher, 14%. What's the level? 14%, 25%, 50%. How much higher will they go on these, quote, unexpected, unknown, potential, speculative, day-to-day -day expenses. That's what bothers me most here, is that it, it's, it leaves the door so wide open for judge to, dr to judge discretion that there's no end. So that what interestingly they didn't even point out is they make the assumption that dad or father doesn't have those unexpected, unknown, reasonable day-to-day -day expenses. Because if, if wife has them, well certainly husband has them. I, this, this one really bothers me because it's so, uh, I can just, I'm going to get hit over the head with it all the time, especially at trial. Well, Judge at Hershen, I'm going to ask for 6000 even though my expenses are only four because we may, you never know, my, my client may want to go on a vacation. That was reasonable. I mean, it, and if it does, this doesn't scream for a need for Missouri to have a formula, I don't know what does for some predictability. I mean, that's the biggest complaint I hear is when I counsel someone, is well, what do you mean? I, you don't know. Well, we can base it. I used to say, well, we can base it. Let's go look at your standard of living. Let's see what our expenses are. And that's where we know we won't go over. We talk about like Judge Beach. We'll kind of look at that as a, perhaps a cap. Well, if you follow this case, there is no cap. Who knows what the ceiling is? It, it really is a something where it's just, it's so convoluted, but it is, not, like I said, no disrespect, but I think this is what I would expect out of the Southern District, is something to this regard. And that's why I said that originally. But so I would encourage you to read it because it is a problematic case when it comes to a pay or maintenance case. And it's certainly something you're going to use uh, if you have the uh, recipient to ask for something even greater than the needs and expenses. I mean, it'll encourage high income and expense statements, and then even going higher. All right, Pasternak. That's an Eastern District case, 2015. Uh, 102319 is the opinion number. This uh, interesting uh, deals with attorney's fees, and one of the things I had not seen or really considered, and specifically it deals with attorney's fees on relocation. Uh, it discusses the application of Section 452.377.13, which typically prohibits the court from awarding attorney's fees to the objector of a relocation when they make a finding that the objection is made or done in good faith. So, uh, in this case, the court held that an award of $12,500 to the mother was reasonable and appropriate. Some underlying facts. This began as a motion to modify physical uh, and legal custody. The relationship between the parents was highly contentious to the point where they couldn't discuss matters regarding legal custody, health, education, and welfare. They were having difficulty during the exchanges, presumably. There's really kind of a footnote that really emphasizes why this began that way. It then became a motion to modify and a relocation uh, subsequently after the filing. At the, at the hearing, the uh, court went into, uh, had questions for mother's attorney about attorney's fees. And during, I presume, cross-examination was a question, well, how do you, what a portion of these fees relate to relocation? And the attorney couldn't tell the court, they couldn't itemize. Uh, very specifically said something to the effect that I don't bill that way. Which, you know, I'm thinking if I'm the judge, if you can't itemize and you're just guessing, it's speculation, I'm not going to award anything, but then again. And the quote in this opinion is interesting. It says, um, I necessarily, I can't necessarily identify what issues I was reviewing at any particular point. The one-third estimate I'm going to give you is as good as we're going to get. I mean, if that's all this court's relying on, which, interesting, on an attorney's fees order, 
So there must be some underlying facts where the court didn't like the other side, didn't like what was going on. But what they held was, was that the statute 452.377.13 is not applicable when there are two distinguish, or distinguishing separate issues going on. So they kind of separated. They said, look, you started as a motion to modify, just joint legal and joint physical. It became sole legal and sole physical to mom. And then it became a relocation. So because you had arguments unrelated to relocation, I'm going to go ahead and award attorney's fees on the portion allocated to the other issue. Now, you may have some disputes as to the amount, but I think the holding is interesting because um, it does talk about something that I've never really we didn't count. I've never really thought about counseling clients on, which was when they come on to a relocation. Look, if we can prove that's a good faith objection, we're, we should be good to go. But of important note here, the court says, which is interesting, and I, again, I think is of importance. Appeals, which this was, are a distinct stage in the proceeding, and the court's denial of attorney's fees for a trial does not control the ability to award attorney's fees on appeal. So even under the relocation statute that says attorney's fees can't be awarded if you, finding, if you have a finding of good faith, presumably with this holding, if mom were to appeal on a denial of relocation, she could get attorney's fees. So it's kind of a backdoor around, they've created a backdoor around the statute to hit an objector with attorney's fees. Alabac or Alabac, Eastern District, 103175, uh, March of 2016, so recent. Um, that's our own case, share. I think I picked it out because it was shares, wherever share is. Back there. So it was a good case. So husband appealed, I mean, if I get this wrong, share, you can just say, because I'm just reading. Uh, husband appealed attorney's fees award on appeal, uh, $12,000. Uh, the grounds uh, for appeal were abuse of discretion and failed to take evidence pursuant to 452.355.1. So that statute reads, unless otherwise indicated the court from time to time, after considering all relevant factors, which is the key, I think, here, including the financial resources of both parties, the merits of the case and the actions of the parties during the pendency of the action may order party to pay a reasonable amount for the cost of the other party of maintaining or defending any proceeding or for attorney's fees, including sums for legal services rendered and costs incurred prior to the commencement of the proceeding and after the entry of final judgment. So what happened here was you have an award of 12,000. It was reversed on appeal. Uh, what happened in the trial court, they did not make a record whatsoever. You know how this goes, you go back into chambers on a motion for attorney's fees, you make your arguments. The court says, now I'm gonna go ahead and make an award, this is what they did here and they didn't take any testimony is what the Court of Appeals said. It says, when a court awards attorney's fees, a court must one, know what debts each party owes, and two, as well, what employment and non-employment income each party has before it can determine either the need or the ability to pay such fees, citing uh, Davis versus Schmidt, which is 210 Southwest 3rd, 494. So what I assume happened was going to court, they just issue a one, actually it was a one paragraph memo, $12,000, done. No testimony, no nothing, zero. The court, which I don't know if shared why, they just reversed. They didn't remand for a hearing. Did you find that peculiar? Okay, because I found that if you just read this not knowing the underlying facts, I thought, gosh, why wouldn't they just remand for a hearing? Because if you've seen that before where there may have been an order without consideration of new debts, so if there's a big time delay between judgment and the trial, they'll remand for, re for further hearing. And I thought that was an interesting thought. Boy, they were just really sending a message and not remanding. But interesting one about demanding hearings. I, I, you know, Making sure you get it on the record. In this case, it worked to our favor but not requesting a hearing because it was reversible error and abuse of discretion to proceed. I mean, they went so far as there was no evidence that counsel argued at all uh, relevant to the record, and therefore they remanded. Uh, Bell versus Bell, Southern District, 
33136, February of 2016. This is another attorney's fees case, but dealing with a third party uh, case. Husband's, or we'll call it father's father, husband's father, husband's dad, was joined as a third party in this case to a dissolution. The trial court awarded $65,826.85 in attorney's fees against uh, both the husband and husband's father, so, whether it be, it was and or, I think is how the, the order read. So husband's father appealed on the basis that there was no authority of the court, even though as a third party in a dissolution case, to enter a judgment of fees against a third party, absent, say, some sort of Rule 11 sanction, I presume. So in it, the court went on to say, We've been unable to discover a case in which a third party was charged with attorney's fees in her costs under 452.355, which is the relevant statute. Nor are we aware of any statute which would provide for such an award. Statutes allowing taxation of costs are strictly construed. No item is taxable as costs unless it's specifically so provided. Strictly construing 452.355, it's our opinion that the legislature intended this statute to permit the allocation and taxing of court costs against, and here's the, the interesting and very good point, a petitioner or a respondent only in a dissolution action. So very specifically held that because that section only reply, or applies to petitioners and respondents, not third party defendants, third party respondents. Now there was a side issue that the court always seems to be, some dicta, talks about whether or not you have a right to appeal. Was a side issue in this case was the payment of master fees. Uh, it was also appealed whether or not the master fees were appropriately taxed. It turns out that father and, or husband and father paid the master fees before appeal. And they did so apparently by consent. There apparently was a motion for contempt or a writ. Uh, and before a hearing, they, they paid it. So the court denied the appeal as moot because they paid it and there was nothing to, to, uh, to determine. But I thought a good practice note here is in the footnote in this case, it says when a defendant pays a judgment after execution or writ of garnishment in aid of execution, the courts have generally held that payment was involuntary. It goes on to say, satisfying a judgment to avoid a finding of contempt does not render payment involuntary. So when counseling clients, even if you have an attorney's fees award, what could have spoiled this would be a voluntary payment and then appealing. Basically, you have to let your client get held in contempt and then appeal it without paying or let them execute. And then I think that first paragraph, it says, when a defendant pays a judgment after execution or writ of garnishment in aid of execution, the court will consider it involuntary. So when we're talking about that, I thought that was of a particular note for your counseling of your clients. All right, Keller, or K versus Keller, which is actually Keller versus Keller, Western District, first Western District case, 78235, June of 2015. Uh, child support and emancipation issue, uh, which you don't often see, and I think is often overlooked, is this was a summary judgment case. And I know years ago, I said something about a summary judgment, and they said, what? You're filing a summary judgment in a family law case? And I, I remember I did one 15 years ago. I think it was in Reynolds County. And the judge looked at me and, and you know, thought I was crazy. What am I doing filing a summary judgment in a family law case? But it's appropriate in certain circumstances. So don't overlook those instances when you can do it. This was an issue where the court questioned the use of a summary judgment. The question here, was it appropriate? Uh, the issues were this. They had a split custody in 2011. Uh, we had one parent receiving child support and another with no allegation um, in terms of father filed a motion to modify in 2013 to terminate the child support for a daughter. So what they had is mom had one child, dad had one child, daughter then becomes emancipated in 2013 by operation of law, no dispute. So now he's seeking to obtain child support for the child in his care, who is now 21. The son uh, was alleged to have mental disabilities and physical disabilities, had problems going uh, through school, couldn't do it, couldn't obtain a job. Dad waited 
years until, you know, three years post what would typically be majority because he didn't go on to college. The son was then receiving Social Security uh, disability. That was not in dispute. Mom filed a motion for summary judgment claiming that the child was emancipated as an operation of law and that in 2011, some two or three years prior to the filing of this motion, he didn't enroll or attend post-secondary education and dad had not sought a, to extend the, a, the child support at the time that he otherwise would be emancipated, which is um, of note here because there's some dispute as to whether or not mom intended that or that was her argument, but I think it's pretty clear that she said, look, you have to file a motion at age 18 if you want to extend child support. So the court went in through uh, various discussions on what was appropriate, when should you file the motion if you want to extend. The court held that they are not precluded from considering an extension of child support under section 452.340 or 452.340.4 or 5. Those are the relevant points. They concluded that they are separate and distinct and can be, are not to be considered together. Point 4 talks about a natural emancipation when you don't go to post-secondary. And point 5 talks about extension due to disability. Mom's argument was 4 precedes 5. If 4 happens before motion, you can't proceed on 5. So the court reversed on the summary judgment saying there was a dispute as to fact and made it very clear that those are to be considered separately. It says that the court's judgment of emancipation presumes that when a child attends a secondary institution and receives continued support past the age of 18, mom's argument that courts are precluded from considering the applicability is a faulty presumption. 340.5 and 340.4 are to be considered separately and independently as exceptions to the general rule. Emancipation, mom had made the presumption that emancipation was presumed. And the court very clearly said emancipation is never presumed. And the burden is this to show facts proving emancipation. The summary judgment is kind of a red herring in this case even though it was filed, but I think it's interesting. But because there was a dispute as to fact and whether or not he actually was emancipated or not as a matter of law, the court reversed on the summary judgment and remanded for further hearing. But it made clear in its opinion what direction the trial court should go in continuing or understanding that the court can continue child support even though the child had not gone to college and dad waited three years to file. So I think the holding here is that you can wait as long as you need uh, to file an extension, so long as you can prove the elements contained under subsection four and five. Very complicated uh, opinion, Schneidhorst. Eastern District, 102017, all kinds of issues going on here. Uh, the, I think the important one, which is maybe a little bit surprising in terms of its holding, on child support. It's an appeal of child support modification to mom. The question was whether uh, financial resources of a family business were available and should be included to dad and whether or not continued support from father's father should be included as income. So some of the facts you have to kind of dig through. There's all kinds of really good stuff in this opinion. It's worthwhile of reading. Father was uh, became a sole owner of Schneidhorst. We all know Schneidhorst. He had purchased the stock from his father after the divorce. He had originally owned 15%. He purchased the additional 85% shortly after the divorce or sometime after the divorce. He was ordered, or his income was around $27,000 a month. After the divorce, uh, dad or father had alcohol issues. You know, alcoholic, was driving the business into the ground Debts were racking up, payments were being missed. Uh, people were just, the business was about ready to, to probably go under. In October of 2013, uh, after a motion to increase the child support and maintenance was filed by mom, so after the motion, father's dad repurchases 
all of the stock in Schneidhorst, or 85%, the, the controlling interest. And it was subject to a previous agreement that his father had after the divorce but prior to the motion, that he could exercise this option to repurchase 85% at any time. So he did it. Father was left with 15%. The father was removed from the business, had nothing to do with it, no control, no, didn't operate the business. Um, there were some extraneous facts about his name was still used to sign checks. He didn't get an income. Uh, he had no benefit other than some health insurance, and that was done for, uh, the court found legitimate reasons why they maintained his health insurance. And so their issue became, what's his income? Was this a fraudulent transfer? Should the business continue to give him money? I mean, dad was giving not only 20-some thousand a month out of the business, but he was using the credit card for all kinds of expenses, and that was another reason that the stock was repurchased. During the time of the motion, father's dad was continuing to pro provide him financial support. Gave him $76,000 to do his alcohol rehab, $140,000 in attorney's fees, and $200,000 in home improvements. And paid five child support installments. And by the time of the trial, father in this case had exhausted all of his trust fund. So he had no money left in his trust fund. He had no employment, was still in rehab, in fact, didn't even show up for court because he was in rehab, didn't testify, had his deposition taken by video. So the ruling of the trial court increased his child support to $5,000 a month. The holding is that the court reversed, finding that there was no evidence that father had any access to the business funds had no evidence that he was going to continue to receive any funds from his family, even though he had received hundreds of thousands of dollars during the pendency of the motion. And the court, uh, the appellate court found that the trial court engaged in speculation. But it, what it did hold is that it talked about you can include financial assistance from family members. But the interesting part of this case was it, it all smells bad. You know, when you have a transfer of stock and ownership during the pendency of a case, he's continued to get support from his family. So I can see as the trial court thinking, I don't like this guy, I don't like the way it looks, I don't like the way it smells, I'm going to go ahead and impute all that money, which it did, and set a new child support award. But the appellate court looked at it a little bit differently and said, here's a guy who has no income, here's a guy who's really unemployed, still in rehab, has ruined his life, it's evident that he drove the business into the ground, and in order to save the business, the father had no other choice but to repurchase the stock. And then they went on a, a big discussion about those payments to the father. You know, the, the attorney's fees, the rehab, the home improvements. They had indicated that had the facts been different, that the money would have been given to the father directly rather than to third parties for his benefit, the court could have concluded that as income to him for purposes of child support. So on pay, and in, this art, or in this opinion... They went on to talk about when payments by family can be taken. It says, the cases are instructive as to when it's proper for a trial court to consider financial gifts to a parent from, the third, or from a third party as a component of a parent's financial resources for purposes of determining child support. The Western District has held that the trial court has never erred in considering substantial lump sum inheritance that men or fathers or women have received from a third party as a financial resource available to them in determining whether there was a change of circumstances. So what they're talking about is money directly, not necessarily money for their benefit directly to third parties, which I found to be interesting in terms of instructions on when you can include it. But it's a very good case in terms of going to uh, through some of these issues. But of a smaller issue raised in this case was the child support here was ordered in gross, $5,000 per month for two or three children. It wasn't incremental. So the court said, it's not erroneous for a trial court to award a gross amount of child support, citing uh, Rockerbomber. Says the comment B to the directions of Form 14, line 12, do allow for incremental child support awards, but it is not mandatory. Says when awarding support for more than one child, a court shall in a gross amount or order incrementally. So I think that was uh, interesting to note that you can do either or uh, by the lines and now uh, confirmed or affirmed in the Eastern District in terms of how child support is awarded. I'm going to go a little bit faster as we go through. Um, Yulesman, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Yulesman, Southern District, 33763. Child support, 
deals with uh, the word equitable abatement. Uh, father, uh, they were divorced in 1998. Father went to prison afterwards. Father was released from prison in 2011. Father filed a motion to emancipate shortly after his release in prison. Uh, and also to determine arrearages, because he wasn't quite certain how much was owed since he wasn't making any payments while his time in prison. He alleged that child support calculation from the Department of Family Services was incorrect because the minor child was not residing with mom for an extended period of time, there were some statute of limitations issues, and that the minor child was emancipated and that dad was in jail for a significant period of time. The, court, the trial court ordered child support down to $18 per month retroactive, and it eliminated arrearages under the equities of the circumstances, quote. And they released him from all back child support, finding that the support to mom was unjust. Now the interesting point was dad never really pled an equitable abatement. He simply asked for determinative arrearages, and the courts here made a finding that it, they inferred equitable abatement. And the facts were undisputed. The children were actually not in the custody of mother for extended periods of time from 2001 to 2004, 2007 to 2009, and a period in which 2011. Other family members were raising the child, and actually mom was paying child support from a court order from DFS to these people. So the issue is whether or not he was required to plead equitable abatement, and the court said no, it's not necessary. The equitable document, uh, doctrine of abatement focuses primarily on whether the child has received adequate support and whether an award of back child support would represent unjust enrichment to the custodial parent. They made a finding that it's clear that mother was put on notice, that father was contending child support calculations were wrong by simply asking for a judicial determination of arrearages. And one of the reasons was that he had spent significant periods of time in other people's custody. So of note here is really in terms of pleading, the court's going to take equity under circumstances and consider equitable abatement, even if not pled, so long as you're questioning the arrearage amount. Edwards. Uh, Child Support, Western District, 78472. Married 1994, two kids, 19 and 14, and, and, uh, currently or at the time of the appeal. Divorced 2014. During the divorce, they had shared custody during the divorce proceedings. They were sharing custody of the 19 and the 14. And in fact, there were some facts that mom was only getting maybe two overnights a month. Uh, but they would visit often. The 19-year-old kind of come and go as they pleased. It was a 14-year-old that they were doing custody. At trial, the court prepared two Form 14s in a split custody arrangement, but just did one parenting plan for the 14-year-old. The issue on appeal was whether or not dual form 14s were appropriate under the circumstances which are reserved normally for split custody. Uh, and so the court concluded that dual form 14s are only appropriate in those situations, but because the court only entered one parenting plan, this was not a split custody situation because, importantly, the court at the trial awarded joint physical and joint legal. Even if mom had custody of the 19 and dad had custody of the 14, because the trial court awarded joint physical and joint legal, the court was precluded from entering dual form 14s. So does, it kind of emphasizes to me what we've, I've typically said is that the, the label or the title joint physical is a label and can preclude other things. You could have sole physical to mom and really a true sharing custody and dad would have been a much better off situation doing a split form 14 arrangement. But because of the title, the label, where mom really only had two overnights but still had joint physical, the court was reversed and had to remand and enter a one form 14, which actually increased probably dad's child support. So lastly, for my section, Tatum v. Tatum, Eastern District, 102465, January of 2016. Another child support question, it all you know usually comes up in the summer months, is the inclusion of private education costs. Real quickly, facts, married 1997, divorced 2005, two kids, joint legal, joint physical, zero child support at the time. In 2009, there was a motion to modify filed. Mom was awarded sole legal and sole physical, given $814 a month in child support. Another motion to modify in 2012, mom seeking inclusion of private school. To address, we had one child who had educational needs that could not be addressed in the public school system. Uh, the child attended public school 2006 to 2008. 
entered private school in 2009. An important fact here is that when the child went to private school, both mom and dad signed a tuition fee agreement. Dad made zero payments. Mom made all the payments from 2009 and thereafter. The trial court ordered dad to pay the private school education and I think restated well-settled law that says that the court will defer to the custodial parent with respect to decisions concerning education beyond that provided by the state system. There are a plethora of Missouri cases ordering a spouse to pay a portion of tuition for private schools where that spouse had not agreed to enroll the child. And in this case, the, child, the father had agreed to enroll the child by signing the fee agreement to the school, although not paying. The test for determining when a court should order over the wishes of one parent is expressed in the language of Form 14, when such schooling, quote, will meet the particular educational needs of the child. So the, the other thing that was uh, of note in this case was that the trial court did not include the private school tuition in the Form 14. That was an element of the appeal. The court went on to specifically say that you, it was an appropriate uh, order for the court to do a Form 14, find the form just and appropriate, and then add on 50% of the tuition on the bottom line, rather than including it on the Form 14 and apportioning it by ratios of income. So interesting twist in terms of adding the private school, not apportioning it by ratios of income, and they found that to be uh, following the law. All right, Courtney, we'll turn it over to you. Good morning. I'm Courtney Knox. I will be continuing this very lively topic of the family law update this morning. Um, I think Joe mentioned this morning that I am licensed in Pennsylvania and that's where I focus my practice, but I do manage offices in five states. So I have a unique perspective in pulling in laws from other states and reviewing those. Um, and I found it fascinating to kind of go over Missouri law and figure all this out for you today and give you this update. So just to get started on this, the first one I have here is Reno versus Reno. The underlying facts in this case are that mother wanted to move to California with her husband uh, who was stationed in the military there. Uh, the original order was for mom to have sole legal custody and for the parties to have joint physical custody. Um, father was uh, an every other weekend father in that arrangement. Um, prior to the trial, father had presented a motion to appoint a guardian ad litem on general accusations of abuse. He didn't plead any with specificity. The motion was denied. Um, then there was a three-day trial on the relocation in which mother was granted custody and permission to relocate to California and father was given supervised visitation. Um, the title of this as custody and relocation is a bit of a red herring because the underlying appeal was actually based on whether or not the trial court erred in not appointing a guardian ad litem in this case. The, st the case law uh, states that the guardian ad litem may be appointed anytime a judge has any discretion over child custody support or anything of the like. But there isn't a mandatory requirement of appointing a guardian ad litem unless there is sufficient evidence offered at trial that if believed shows actual abuse or neglect occurred the court then can either upon motion of a party or sua sponte order the pleadings amended to conform to the evidence to appoint that guardian ad litem. In this case, the trial court was actually kind of lively in itself in saying that the dad's arguments were basically ornery, um, that all of his complaints were for accusations that occurred prior to the original custody during the marriage. No complaints of abuse occurred from the date of the original custody order to the proposed relocation. Um, and that all the abuse was emotional yelling and things like that, nothing that would constitute actual abuse. Um, so the, the appeals court stated that you must plead actual abuse or neglect with specificity in a motion, and in the event that you don't, you have to amend the pleading to include that if you're going to file it at the appeal. Neither party alleged the abuse in the pleading, um, and father neglected to file a transcript even showing that any specificity had been pled during the trial, so the trial court assumed that that wouldn't have helped his case. This case is Pasternak versus Pasternak, which uh, Scott Trout also addressed, but for a different order, uh, a different set of facts. In this case, 
mother lost her job. Um, it was, evidence was shown that during the dissolution process, she was distracted and her contract wasn't going to be renewed as a teacher. She therefore resigned and then attempted to find a job close by. She applied to several districts and apparently found a job in her hometown where her family lived. Um, it was approximately 50 plus miles away from where the parties lived as a married couple. Uh, prior to her decision to move, the parties had had uh, shared legal custody and joint physical custody, um, although the father did have every other weekend and uh, weeknight overnight. Um, after the hearing, it, mom, mother was given permission to move and father appealed. Um, the court did apply the eight-factor test as to whether the best interests were reached, but the, trial, or the appellate court did state that first you have to show that the relocating party brought their relocation action in good faith. Um, and good faith was basically defined um, as not relocating for the sole purpose of interfering with the other parent's custody. So once you meet that original threshold, then you enter into the best interest analysis in the case. There was an eight-factor test that the, that the court applied. Um, six of the eight did apply in this case. Um, one of the primary reasons here that they determined that mother was the more appropriate caregiver and that relocation was appropriate was that one of their children was diagnosed with ADHD and father had refused to provide the medication. Um, he refused even after a second opinion and then only after a third opinion did he grudgingly uh, start giving the child medication. But had given the child conflicting information saying he wasn't gonna give it to him on the weekend because if he took the medica medication too often he might die and it gave child great anxiety knowing that he was getting conflicting information from mom and dad. So the courts determined that it was in the best interest for mother to be able to relocate near her family, have the support of her family, and to also create some distance between the parents so that to potentially diffuse their contentious relationship moving forward. Moving on, we have another custody and relocation matter. This one is Schroeder versus Schroeder. Mother moved to Tulsa and father sought modification of custody, which was granted. Um, the original custody order was shared physical and joint, uh, joint legal custody, but this was a true shared arrangement in which father and mother enjoyed week on, week off with the children. Um, mother moved to Tulsa um, and the court demanded that she not be permitted to relocate with the child and to come back. Now the main issue in here, again, this is sort of a red herring on the relocation, is that when the trial court made its decision that it was in the best interest of the children for mother not to relocate, to stay with father, the trial court did not issue a findings of fact that outlined the eight factors for the best interest of the children. They just glossed over that and said they thought that stability and the child's best interest would be preserved by staying in their current home and moving forward. Um, and the trial court misapplied the law per the appellate court when it failed to enter the written findings regarding the relevant best interest factors. The appellate court will always affirm if the decision has been supported by substantial evidence um, and the appellant must raise lack of findings in a motion and try to amend the judgment or uh, proceed to the appeal. Um, so the court said that without deciding on the merits, whether the relocation was appropriate or not, that just due to the fact that the trial court failed to provide those findings of fact, that it must be reversed and remanded. This case is relatively interesting. This is a property case. Um, the court issued an order resolving all of the property issues in the case, listing all of the assets, all of the debts, and saying that every debt that was in either party's individual name would be taken by that party, that they had the requirement to take the other party's name off of anything if it was debt that they accrued themselves either throughout the marriage or after the, the marriage had ended after their separation. Um, but there was one debt that was a joint debt that there was no reference whatsoever as to who accrued the debt, that there was no indication that either party was willing to take on that debt, that there was no information whatsoever, just listed it and assumed for it to be divided. Neither of the parties wanted the debt, clearly, um, and so they appealed 
on the basis that the trial court had failed to do so. And I, I think it's interesting to note that this was the third amended judgment in this case. Uh, I don't have all the information on the first two, um, but on the third try, they still didn't quite get it right moving forward to that. Now, the problem here is that because the court did not assign that debt to either husband or wife, it wasn't a final judgment. So apparently the proper procedure would have been to go back and look for a fourth amended judgment from the trial court before appealing to uh, the appellate court for that. It was dismissed because the judgment wasn't final and the court found they didn't have jurisdiction to hear the issue. This is another case that Scott Trout also touched on and this is a different part of the case that was appealed as well. Alabac versus Alabac. Um, this is interesting. Um, in the dissolution, husband and wife had agreed to most subjects except for the stock and insurance policy payment. The parties had gone in on the day of trial and listed several stipulations that they had agreed to, but then proceeded to have a trial on the merits on the other items that weren't included. Um, in the record, it shows that the trial court even stated that it was confused because a lot of the testimony would have uh, supported a decision different from the things that they had stipulated to already. Um, but they hadn't included, um, the husband owned a, his own business, it was called the Tag Group, and there was a money market account owned by the business. Pursuant to the agreement, uh, the stipulation and the order of court, the husband was awarded the entirety of the business in the marriage, but the court chose to divide that money market account. Husband had testified that it was just money he had left over, um, that he put into this money market account for his business. But the court concluded that husband could have paid that money to himself and the fact that he had it and he used it basically as like a slush fund for his business caused it to be a marital asset that was appropriate to be divided. Um, the second account, there were three accounts that the parties addressed. Um, the second account the parties agreed that the court had done it wrong, that it was in, not in accordance with their stipulation. And the third, um, the court divided an account in half um, that was inappropriate because the parties had also stipulated to it. So the trial court had some trouble, again, with uh, applying the stipulation when they had a trial on the merits that supported a different division of the property. Um, the husband did not allege that the division of that money market account, which was about $10,000, materially altered the distribution of property and the standard that the appellate court set was that uh, an erroneous classification of any asset won't be overturned on appeal unless the overall division is unfair. So if there's a minor mistake of an erroneous classification of an asset, the court's not going to overturn or remand the entire decision based on that if the overall distribution is, unfair, is not unfair. This is another case uh, on property. This is Ferry versus Ferry. Um, this is an interesting case. Um, the parties went through um, a divorce and everything was divided. Between the time that the discovery was closed and the time that the trial was held, father had lost his job as a financial advisor. He had managed accounts um, for a financial company in excess of $57 million. Um, wife only worked in the capacity to help him build his book of business. Um, husband testified that her input was minimal, that he had most of his clients prior to the marriage. Um, but prior to that, the, the court, he lost his job and he signed a new contract and didn't disclose it to the court or to wife at that time because it was between the close of evidence and the start of trial. Wife knew that he had this book of business and she knew what it was worth. Apparently during the marriage, he had been offered several times $500,000 in exchange for his book of business to come work for another financial company. Something similar happened here in that he was given upfront loans uh, of about $250,000. So upfront loans are given to a financial advisor saying if you make this much money for us in this amount of time and you stay working for us for this amount of time, these loans will be forgiven. So it basically equates to being a signing bonus but that you have to earn over the course of, in this case, five years. Wife argued that 
when she found out about this, which was several years later, because husband then filed for a modification of support and fully disclosed all of his income um, as it became vested in each of those five years. So a fifth of it was uh, vested in each of those five years. Uh, wife discovered it and reopened the case and filed an appeal um, saying that he fraudulently, fraudulently excluded this information from her in the knowledge and that she should be awarded half of those upfront loans or $125,000. The trial court awarded her $10,000 based on the testimony that she had contributed to creating his book of business, but that husband's testimony was that her contribution was minimal. Um, the holding was that an aggrieved party may bring an equitable cause for omitted marital property under fraud or mistake, but when, because wife knew that the book of business existed and she knew that it had a price tag of approximately $500,000 on it, that it wasn't fraud because she was not ignorant of the party. Uh, the, trial, the trial court's judgment was reversed and there was no substantial evidence supporting a finding of fraud given her knowledge of the asset. There is a nine-part fraud test also that's clearly enumerated in this case if you want to take an opportunity to look at it. But the general idea is that there had to be a misrepresentation by the, by the party, that there had to be no knowledge of the asset, and the general idea that it was hidden in some way. And the trial court or the appellate court determined that there was none of that, that the husband spent no effort to hide that from wife, although they did make a comment that they didn't condone, condone his behavior, that he didn't tell her that that happened prior to trial. This case is on jurisdiction. This is actually relatively interesting. This is Blanchett versus Blanchett. Um, the parties lived in West Virginia and father filed for uh, divorce in 2005. Um, wife, who at the time was pregnant, moved to Missouri um, and had the son, their son in 2005. <coughs> The question was, did West Virginia have subject matter jurisdiction over the child that was born in Missouri, even though the action had been brought in West Virginia prior to her moving there while she was pregnant? Um, the parties also had an older son, so there was another child that attached jurisdiction to the case in West Virginia. Um, the interesting part was, mother participated in the case in West Virginia, and then in 2013, attempted to register the order from West Virginia in Missouri, and father filed at the same time in 2013 for a modification in West Virginia looking for more time. Instead of having one week in the summer, he wanted six weeks in the summer. Um, that was granted in West Virginia because at this time in 2013, mother decided not to participate because she had registered the order in Missouri and was attempting to file for a modification there. The additional six weeks in the summer changed the classification for child support, so father's child support was then also reduced. Uh, mother raised the appeal that West Virginia was not the home state of the child that was born after the dissolution had been raised, um, who was born in Missouri and had never lived in West Virginia. Um, and the, the appellate court agreed or disagreed completely, saying that the child that was born at the time of the dissolution attached jurisdiction to the child that wasn't born at the dissolution, basically for the sake of judicial economy, saying that the purpose of the UCCJEA, which was applied here, is to reduce conflict, not to create additional conflict. Um, and the appropriate order would have done here. Now, the, the interesting part is that had mother done this procedurally correctly, she probably would have had jurisdiction in Missouri. What needed to be done is she needed to file in West Virginia to divest them of jurisdiction. West Virginia courts had to voluntarily re relinquish their jurisdiction and say that Missouri was now the appropriate uh, jurisdiction to move forward with this. She never took that action. She just filed in Missouri after registering the order and paid no attention to West Virginia. Um, so the court stated that West Virginia was still the appropriate state even though both children had lived in Missouri for over five years. Um, so I, the moral of the story is make sure you follow your procedure um, if you want to get your way moving forward. Okay, the next case is Rallo versus Rallo. And this is listed under jurisdiction, although there are, there are several issues that were raised on appeal and addressed by the judge. Um, Father moved with the children to St. Charles County from St. Louis County 
and filed dissolution there. Father moved to file a motion to dismiss on impro improper venue and sought to challenge the venue, the custody determination, the division of property, and the award of attorney's fees. Um, the court first addressed the issue of venue um, because wife moved to St. Charles County and immediately filed for dissolution. She hadn't lived there long at all, under three months um, when she filed, and the parties had lived historically in St. Louis County. But the court, the appellate court found that the intent uh, was more important than the duration of where you are, where you're residing to determine your domicile for purposes of venue. So the court found that it was appropriate that wife filed in St. Charles County. Um, it's also important to note that had father filed in St. Louis County, it would also have been appropriate, but she was the first to file. Um, in order to transfer the case, which father pled in the alternative, he would have had to have proven that the children had lived in St. Louis County for 90 days before the action or that it was in the children's best interest to have it in St. Louis. He had none of that, those facts to support a transfer argument either, so the court determined that venue was appropriate in St. Charles County. When it comes to the custody determination, uh, it was found that they applied the eight-part test for the best interest of the children, um, but that father was insincere in his requests for time. Um, father had regular custody scheduled. He had evening visits, he had every other weekend, and he missed several visits. He basically said it was too hard for him to get there and he couldn't exercise all of his time. And the courts found that his request for sole custody was insincere based on the effort that he didn't put forth with regard to custody of his children. Um, mother was granted sole physical custody because she took the children to their doctor's appointments, um, took them to school, cooked and bathed them, whereas father was very involved in the children's lives, but he was the basketball coach and the baseball coach, and he was basically classified as um, the activities dad. And the court found that giving him more time in the summer um, versus more time during the school year would still honor the division of labor, labor that the parties had during their marriage, um, and that it was an appropriate decision, and that the custody still should be with mother. Um, the other issue that came up in this case was a pension that father had while they were working. Um, he stated that much of the pension was earned prior to marriage, six years of the 10 years or so that he worked there. Um, and he had some paperwork provided that showed that he did work there at that time, but there was no specificity pled with, with regard to how much it was or how it was calculated or anything of that nature. I guess it's important to note that father was representing himself pro se um, and didn't have uh, the appropriate documentation to show that part of that pension should be, include, should be excluded. Um, so the trial court did include the entirety of the pension to be divided, um, and the appellate court determined that was appropriate because there was no evidence offered to the contrary showing that he shouldn't, or that he should have had some of that excluded based on uh, the timing of that. Um, it's also interesting to note that while this was occurring, neither party was employed. Um, father had previously been employed uh, working at a, a grocery store, um, and mother had never been employed. Um, she moved in with her grandparents. He was living on and off with his parents, with friends. Um, the courts did then impute him with a minimum wage earning capacity, did not impute anything to mother, um, even though the children were school age and whatnot. Um, and the child support was based on his imputed minimum wage income only. Um, father appealed that imputed salary was not appropriate um, based on the fact that he wasn't working and that mother could also have income imputed to her. And the court ruled that the imputed salary was appropriate um, as the evidence showed that husband had not used his best efforts to find employment. Um, and given the determination that he was actually capable of some full-time employment. Uh, father had raised claims that he had uh, physical ailments that would prevent him from working full-time and things of that nature, uh, but he had applied for social security disability and had been denied um, and said that he couldn't work during the appeal because then he wouldn't get it again, not really saying that he was actually physically disabled, just that he was trying to get that disability. Now. Um, maybe the most important part of the case law that is established in this case is the awarding of attorney's fees. Um, there is apparently a diverging set of opinions, a vein of opinions that doesn't follow the statutory law. And just so I make sure I get all this right, I did make sure I can quote this from the case. Um, 
There is a statute that is 452.355.1, which authorizes an award of reasonable attorney fees in dissolution cases after the court considers all relevant factors, including the financial resources of both parties, the merits of the case, and the actions of the parties during the pendency of the action. It's important to note that in Missouri, apparently there are in other civil cases, a requirement that unusual circumstances be present in order to award counsel fees. This statute was entered in 1974 and has been the law since then, um, although cases even after that have required that unusual circumstances be appropriate for uh, awarding counsel fees. Um, the court was very specific here in saying that it is unnecessary and inappropriate to address whether the case also involves unusual circumstances before awarding counsel fees. Um, they, in the footnotes in this case, which if this is something that's relevant to you, I would suggest that you at least print out the page with the footnotes on it, has a list of probably 25 cases that have erroneous rules in it. And it said all of these cases should not be followed moving forward with regard to counsel fees. So there is a, a myriad of cases out there with incorrect law in them that the court explicitly states should be excluded from consideration moving forward. Uh, and just as a little reference there, mother had spent $10,000 on the entire case on a flat fee basis, uh, and father had represented himself, and the court just divided the counsel fees between the two of them and determined that that was an appropriate division of the counsel fees moving forward. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one other issue that came up there. Um, the parties had a tax refund that mother received. It was over $6,000 and that she used and it was dissipated by the time the case came to trial. Father argued that it should be included in the division of marital assets and he should be awarded some of that. Um, the trial court or the appellate court did not find any merit in that, however, um, because they found that she, wife, had used this for reasonable living expenses. Um, she had no income. Um, she received minimal child support based on his imputed minimum wage earning capacity um, and that uh, you can't divide a marital asset that no longer exists at the time of the dissolution um, if uh, it was used to support somebody's reasonable living needs. Okay. The next one we have here is another jurisdiction case. This is Schaefer versus Schaefer. Um, in this case, um, mother moved to Florida while she was pregnant. Father filed an action to be present at the birth. And in response, mother filed for dissolution in Missouri. Father was granted custody and the child was brought back to Missouri. Um, in the meantime, mother had also moved to Texas um, and was trying to get not only Florida case or the Florida courts, but the Texas courts in an attempt to divest father of his custody rights. Um, the court awarded uh, sole custody to father at that point. Mother filed an appeal that it was actually sort of amusing to read the opinion that the appellate court basically said was made of nonsense. She raised five counts um, and only the first point even received consideration because the court said points two through five were completely irrelevant, didn't appropriately plead um, any appealable issues moving forward. Um, mother raised whether Missouri had jurisdiction uh, to determine the dissolution and the custody, even though she had filed the dissolution herself in Missouri. Um, Wife, act, the appellate court found that wife acted inconsistently with the claim that there was no jurisdiction um, by participating and filing the Missouri dissolution case without raising any objection to the trial court's authority at the time of the trial uh, to determine on child custody until there was an allegation that she didn't comply with the trial court's ruling. Only at that time did she appeal saying that Missouri didn't have jurisdiction. Uh, the trial court or the appellate court ruled that she had waived um, that jurisdictional argument by not raising it at trial and by participating in the Missouri dissolution case. And last but not least, we have McNeil versus McNeil Snyder. Um, in this case, um, Mr. McNeil was a prisoner 
and he filed his appeal for dissolution of marriage directly with the Supreme Court, alleging that the two statutes listed are unconstitutional because they don't grant prisoners an unconditional right to be present in court to litigate civil actions to which the prisoners are party. Uh, this case is interesting. There was also a dissenting opinion, um, and if this is something that uh, interests you, I would encourage you to read this opinion. Um, basically, the appellate court stated that the statutes weren't unconstitutional on their face. The, con the statutes allow for a prisoner to participate in a dissolution action or other civil action, which doesn't have the consequence of additional criminal uh, incarceration. Um, in other means, not in person. They could have participated by video conference, they could have participated by telephone, there were other actions. The appellant here, Mr. McNeil, stated that his constitutional rights were violated because the statute was unconstitutional. The problem is the statute wasn't unconstitutional per the appellate court, it was the trial court's application because the trial court actually did not allow Mr. McNeil to participate in his dissolution. It was dismissed for lack of judgment in a timely fashion, um, although any of his motions to participate by telephone, participate by video conference were all denied. So the application uh, by the trial court of, of these statutes probably was unconstitutional, but because that's not the issue that Mr. McNeil raised, the trial court determined that this was not, the statutes weren't un unconstitutional and the appeal was denied. The, the dissenting opinion basically gets into the equity of that argument and whether that was fair to Mr. McNeil moving forward um, and that they should consider it on its merits regardless, um, which is a valid point that he wasn't actually given his due process to move forward with this. Um, however, because he didn't appropriately plead uh, the, the action in this case, his appeal was dismissed.